First Peter, I know that's where we're going to be, so let's launch out into the deep. And uh, I'm going to try to remember now where I, what, where I left off. Oh yeah, that's going to be good. That's going to be good. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. I got it up on the screen. By the way, just a, by way of announcement, um, next week a lot of us are going to go to Bible camp next week down in uh, Wilderness Point. That is, if you find nowhere in the Ozarks, we're in right in the exact middle of it. And uh, it's a wonderful place, and they're going to teach these kids the Bible all week, and a lot of these pastors I know, they're good men, and we just have a good time down there. So we're going to be down there, and uh, we're going to leave right after I get done preaching Sunday morning. So you pray, because it's a long, 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 that's about six or seven hours with potty breaks. So anyway, just pray for us as we travel, and, and uh, so there'll be no Sunday night service, no Wednesday night service, and uh, just pray. I don't know who's preaching there this week, but just pray for uh, God's anointing in that, all right? And so just uh, lift, lift us up as we're down there, and we'll come back refreshed and, and ready to take the devil on. Amen? First Peter chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with... Fire. Let me, let me just kind of throw this out and ask you very quickly. What does fire have to do with gold? Does anybody know? And I'm not saying you have to be a gold expert. So some of this stuff's real simple. But what does fire have to do with gold? It does what? You take gold, you take rocks that have a little bit of gold in it, and you put those in the pot. And turn that heat on, and it's going to melt down everything that's in there. And the dross that's on the top is not the gold. And what happened? Now you get this, and think about this, because this is what he's saying. He's talking about gold that perishes, they'll be tried with fire. God's going to put you in the pot. He's going to put you in the heat. Because there are things in everybody's life that aren't necessary and they actually take away from God's glory shining through and in your life so the fire has the purpose of all of that dross just kind of comes to the top that gold gold's heavy and it's gonna settle down on the bottom so anybody that does this they just kind of scrape that junk off the top that's discarded and what's left is they're trying to purify that gold as much as possible. Now I've heard this, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard that on this earth there really is no such thing as absolutely pure 100% gold. I've heard gold that's .99999 pure, but it's not 100% absolute pure, no additives whatsoever gold. Contrast that with what John saw in heaven, in New Jerusalem. The gold on the streets was so pure, what did it look like? Glass. Okay? Can you, I, I can't even imagine that. That the most precious thing on this earth is gold, and God has it in such abundance in heaven, and He has it it's so pure... And yet he refers to it as pavement. Walking on it, amen. But that'd be exciting. But there are things in your life that God is going to, he's going to burn that dross out of that. He's going to take that stuff out. But it has to be done by being tried with fire. There are beliefs that we have that are not right according to the scripture. And God will always test our beliefs up against the word of God. And he'll do that a lot of times by taking us through the fire. So he says this, he's talking about your faith, the trial of your faith, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what? 
or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them, whenever those prophets spoke, that was Jesus in them. When Elijah talked, that was Jesus. When Enoch spoke, that was Jesus. When Isaiah, Jeremiah, when these men of God, when Nathan, the prophet, came to David, the Spirit of Jesus Christ was in Nathan. And those words that came out of his mouth were not his words. They were the words of Jesus Christ. He was there. Amen. That's what, that's what it tells you. Which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Underline that part in your Bible. Make a note of that. Make you a bumper sticker of it. I don't care. Write it on your hand or whatever. That the sufferings will come but they will bring glory following after that. God will always, number one, God will always be praised for it. And number two, God will shine His glory down on your life and you will be thankful that God took you through these things. Amen. You'll be thankful for it. 1 Peter chapter 4 is a, Paul reiterates this again. So turn over there. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. David said, Yea, though I walk up to the valley of the shadow of death, bypass it around, take the side road, get on the other side of it. I will fear... Is that what he said? Yea, though I leap over the valley of the... No, it's not what he said. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I've told you this before. Having had a near-death experience, I've asked God many times, God, when it's for real, when you're going to take me out of this earth, I want it like I've seen in people in this church that have passed on. I want it like I've seen in the faces and the comments and the people that have passed from this life to the next. They knew it. They had a peace about them. When I was a little boy, first started coming to this church, we had a man that crossed the street, James Bond. I told you about him. He got leukemia. And he was, and the preacher went to him and he accepted Christ and was saved before he died. And the night, my mama came home and told me this. The night that he died, he's laying in that hospital bed and he's going, can you hear that? What? That singing. You don't hear that music? That's the prettiest music I've ever heard in my life. And they didn't hear a thing. Okay? I don't doubt one second he was hearing the angelic realm singing, praising the Lord. I want to hear that. Okay? I don't want to be hearing Highway to Hell. Hell ain't no bad place to be. I don't want to be hearing that my last final breath on this earth. Amen? I want to hear some shouting and some singing and some glory and amazing grace and everything else. That's what I want. For, and I, I'm just going to say this and I'm going to move on. First time I read this, as I'm studying Bible prophecy, first time I read this, the first thought I had was rapture. Beloved, we have, we have been ingrained, it's been ingrained into the mindset of American church that we are raptured and then literally all hell breaks loose. That has been forced into us, it has been taught us, I, I accepted his fact, but then I started looking in the Bible, and I don't see it. I went, look, I went asking God questions. And the first time I read this, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened. And I got a feeling, it's just, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, that there's going to be some people that when things go bad and the fire comes on, that it's going to mess them up doctrinally because they were told nothing's going to happen to you. God's going to take you out and then it's all going to be turned loose. And they're going to think, wait a minute, this ain't, this ain't what I read. This ain't how the books told me. 
This ain't what the preacher, this ain't what the YouTube video said. Beloved, think it not a strange thing concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. And I've even been told, and one of the reasons why I was told that Peter was not to be read by us Christians for doctrinal issues is because of this right here. Because it contradicts their rapture theory. It contradicts it. And so what they did was, instead of changing their theory, let's just take out this verse. Now, I don't care if you leave it in the Bible, but then tell people, ignore that. It's the same as just taking it out of the Bible itself. Amen. Turn to Matthew 3.11. Let me show you something. Our Savior, the prophets of old, foretold a time when a fiery baptism is going to occur. Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. This is John Jean-Baptiste, John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with, number one, the Holy Ghost. When you were saved, you were baptized by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came into you, washed you clean with the water by the Word of God, washed away all your sins, created in you a clean heart, renewed a right spirit within you. That's what the Holy Ghost did when you got saved. Okay? But, has there not been since you've been saved little tiny fiery trials along the way? Has not some of the things that you once believed been put to the test and God burned off old ideas that were not right, not biblical, and you started seeing things differently than you ever saw before. Who knew who's ever, ever done that before? Had revelations from the Bible. You were thinking one way, and you were reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, boom! Whoa! Look at that! Okay? And so anyway, when, that, when those trials come, God is burning off the dross of false doctrine. He's burning off the dross of sins in our life. Addictions and habits and Thoughts and ways of living. God is burning those out of our life. He uses the example of gold and being tried in the fire. He uses the example of a vine and the husband and coming and cutting off branches that don't produce any fruit. By the way, what does he do with the branches that don't produce any fruit? Cast them into the what? How come fire is always being brought up? And these things that God is going to do with us and to us it's always accompanied with fire. God's going to do it with fire. So he promised two things. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, number one. And number two, he's going to baptize you with fire. So turn to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Look at what Jesus said. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already... What's that word? Kindled. Who's got one of those? A Kindle? I want to just kind of unhook the train just for a minute. All around us, we are being marketed the fiery trial, which is to come. Kindles. Things called spark. Things called ignite. Okay? Things called evolve, evolution, revolution. Okay? Marketing, product naming, product logos and slogans all around us are foretelling, I believe, a fire event. The Kindle fire. Absolutely. And the idea behind that, Heather, is... I'm glad you brought that up. The idea behind that is... They want you to read their books so that kindles a spark that is inside of you. Because the New Age teaches, the Kabbalah teaches, the pagans teach, the Wiccans believe, all of these cult, Hindus, Buddhists, you name it. They all believe that, what, that a 
a fragment of the same thing. That inside of you, there is a piece of God. A divine spark. And something is going to happen to kindle that spark and you will erupt in a flame of Godhood. You and that divine thing inside of you are going to be joined together in that flame. Okay? Now that's the devil's way of saying it. You're reading the Bible, you're reading God's version of it. I'm come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it already be kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straight until it be accomplished. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. And I want to tell you something. What I like what I see. This man that called me, Brother Rick, wants to run for Congress. I like what I see. Because while the lost heathens and liberals of this country are pleading for us all to join together and be one and not be divided, there's some people that's got some sense that are standing up and they're saying, we are not joining with you. Amen. We're not joining your Muslim cult. Yeah. We're not joining your sodomite pride thing. We're not... I got ticked off. I read an article from the Post-Dispatch yesterday where the gay, lesbian, pride deal, they complained about the St. Louis Cardinals. St. Louis Cardinals every year have a Christian day, ball game. And they invite Christian athletes, Christian speakers, that after the game, these people stay and they have, you know, kind of like a little Christian motivation thing. Well, they invited a former Cardinal player, can't remember who it was, and the Post-Dispatch said that gays and lesbians are all up in arms because this man has made inflammatory statements against the gay, lesbian, whatever crowd. Now, they never said what it was he said. But they're just lashing out and saying, this is not right that this man is saying these things. And, and the Cardinal said, look, we're having Christian Day and next month, we're going to have Gay and Lesbian Day. They're going to have their day. You're going to have your day. Shut up. Okay? Listen. God never told us to just get a, go along to get along with everybody. Amen. Some things, you're going to have to cut it and say, I'm done. I'm not going to put up with this. I'm going to take a stand against it. This is evil. This is not right. This is not who we are. And I'm coming out of it. You want me to be united with you? Then you change your mind. Don't expect me to change mine. Coexist. These stupid bumper stickers. With all these religious symbols everywhere. Let's all get along. Listen. First thing, if they want us to get along, first thing they're going to have to do is take that Muslim symbol out. Because the Muslims hate the Jews. They hate the Christians. And they want to kill us all. How can we coexist with people who want us to die? So let's take that out. I, I don't want to get into all that. But anyway, look at what he says. Suppose you that I come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And I hear from people every week telling me that they... They can't get along with their family members now. They can't get along with people in their family because the sodomites in their family are coming out and everybody's saying, oh, that's fine. Oh, that's good. Oh, we, 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 you know, they're still part of our family. Let's get along with them. And they're saying, we're not doing that. Amen. You know, we love them. We're going to pray for them. But if you want us to come to the Christmas party and, my, and your son, my nephew, is going to be bringing his boyfriend lip locking in front of my kids we're not coming amen and I'm just telling you I don't, I don't think you ought to go around purposely trying to get ignorant with people to make them mad at you and think you're doing the will of God but I'll tell you something 
You preach the truth to these people in love. And they'll hate your guts. You do the right thing even if they're not going to. Okay? But the division is going to be there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, turn there. Fire. Fire's coming. Fire's coming. There, there are issues that maybe some of you are going through right now. Where there is a fiery trial taking place in your life. It is a rough time. You're not sure how you're going to get through it. But, and you don't like it. The heat is on. But you've been there before. And you know that on the other side, there are things now that are not part of your life anymore that used to be. Amen. And then you look back and say, God, I'm glad you did that to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of your life must be the solid rock of Jesus Christ. You build your house anywhere else and it's on sand. And when God shakes the heavens and the earth, and when God floods this earth again, not with water, fire. When the flood of unrighteousness, the Bible says, takes over this, this world, if your house is not built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ, your house, your life, everything about you is going to fall. It's going to explode right in front of you. Our church must be built upon the foundation of the solid rock of the Word of God, Jesus Christ. If it's not, what are we doing here? If it's not, when the devil shakes us, and he's been shaking us, he's been coming at us, he's been flooding us, fiery trying us. He's been doing these things to some people, to this church. If we weren't built on the solid rock, we'll crumble. We'll fall. Okay? So now look at verse, um, and you just take that and apply it to everything. Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. Fire gets it down to the core. Shows you what's on the inside of it. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And you take that now, and you apply that to the whole span of your life, whereby God has allowed a fiery trial to come your way. And it, once again, things that you had as part of your life that don't belong there, when the fire comes, they will be burnt and you will suffer loss, but you'll be saved. Yet so as by fire. Because you're recognizing now the benefit of God's fire and what God releases or allows to come against us. I'm telling you, God allows devils to come at you. He allows it to happen. Why? To manifest His power in your life. God allowed Pharaoh. In fact, God drug Pharaoh over to the Red Sea. We just talked about that a couple weeks ago on Sunday night. God drug Pharaoh over to the Red Sea and, and put him there. Why? Because He wanted Israel to pass through that fire of the Red Sea. That's what he wanted. And it worked, didn't it? And when they got to the other side, what happened to Pharaoh? <sighs> gone. The horse and his rider gone. So, you will at times, because you have built wrong things. Let me give you this example. I wanted, more than anything, here, I wanted the best, brightest, biggest, 
Christian school in America. I wanted it right here. And I did everything that I knew how to accomplish it, which wasn't much, because I didn't know much. And I would walk through that learning center, and I would weep, and I would pray and say, God, fill these little offices with students. God, just bring them in so we can manifest your word in their life and make a change in their life and raise up a generation of young people. I mean, I wanted that. But it was something that I built and not God. You know how I know? It's not here. We had fiery trials and it burned them off. And I stood there and watched it happen. And you know what? By that time, I was glad to see it go. Okay? It's kind of like you're driving this really, really piece of junk automobile and you're fixing it like every other week just to keep it alive doing CPR on the motor come on breathe for me okay and all of a sudden the thing catches fire and you're going well I'm glad that thing's burning up (laughs) it's time to get a new one hon okay you see what I'm saying God's going to bring this stuff now I believe that there is coming a big one. The big one's coming. Okay? Turn to 2 Thessalonians. Turn, turn there. We're just walking through the Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. See, that's what I... If, if you were to ask me, Pastor, what do you want for this church? Number one, I want this church, I want our faith to grow exceedingly. And number two, I want our charity toward each other to abound. I want you people to care about you people. And I want you people to care about you people. And I want all y'all to care about me. And I want me to care about you. And I want you guys in that camera to care about us. And we care about you. And care about what's going on in your life. Okay? When or if I get the chance... And people call here and just want to visit with me for a while. I try to take the call if I can. Because that means something to them. They don't treat me as a celebrity. They're not going, oh, I'm never going to watch this phone again. I talked to my God. They're not doing that. They just need scripture. They need their pastor to show them something out of the Bible that's going on in their life. Because they're going through fiery trials. And I'm just telling you, I, I want, out of this church, our faith to grow and our charity to abound. Okay? Anything else that God gives us? Wow. So look at verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Did you see that word, Tribulation. Do you see it? The word tribulation is directed right at you. Don't forget it. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. In 1 Peter, he teaches you that he that hath suffered has ceased from sin. Now, I'm not even going to ask here, Who in here has sins that they're tired of and they want them gone? I'm not going to ask you that because I already know the answer. You all do. Okay? Not me, of course, but you guys. No, me too. God's process for that is fire. No other way. That's God's process for removing those things. So that's what he's saying here tribulations and persecutions that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Because if you were to, if I were to go around the room and say, do you think you're worthy of the kingdom of God? What would you say? Melissa's already going, absolutely not. Okay? So what's God going to do? He's going to bring you through the suffering to make you worthy. 
God does not call those who are qualified. God qualifies those who he calls. Okay? God does not call the good people to be saints. He calls sinners and makes them saints. Amen? Let him do it. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. God brought Nebuchadnezzar and went and got all the people out of Jerusalem and put them in captivity. You know what he did after that? He punished the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar through Belshazzar. Punished them for doing it. God said in uh, Ezekiel 38 concerning Gog and Magog and those nations, He said, I'm going to put a hook in your mouth and I'm going to drag you down and I'm going to have you come against the mountains of Israel. I'm going to have you come against my people. The very next chapter, God says, since you came down after my people, I'm going to get you. That's funny to me. Amen. Okay, I just think that's funny. Uh, God did that with Pharaoh. Pharaoh, what would you let those people go for? I don't know why I let those people. I'm going to go get them. And God drug Pharaoh down there. And when he got him in the right spot, he just <laughs> covered him up. Because that's what that says here. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Look at verse 8. Tell me how Jesus is coming back. In flaming fire. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to do it with flaming fire, people. He's, when he comes and appears, it's going to be with fire. Revelation chapter 8. Turn there. Oh, this is good now. I'm going to throw something at you. I'm going to make you think. Okay? In Revelation chapter 8, there's some events that are going to take place. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul teaches us about our translation. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. You shall not all sleep, but you shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last, what? Trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. The angel took the censer and filled it with what? Fire of the altar and cast it onto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and what? Fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Do you think God means that? Do you think that's going to happen? And I'm going to tell you something. Maybe, maybe we ought to look at, at this as if we might be standing here watching it happen. Boy, it gets me in trouble with people. They don't like me saying that. But I know some people that withstood fire that was seven times hotter. What does that tell you? Seven times. How many trumpets are being blown here, Ryan? Seven. Had to add, had to add it up, didn't you? Okay. Seven. Okay. There's a connection there, people. Okay. So now watch this. And the second angel sounded, verse 8, and as it were a great mountain burning with what? Fire and was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. If you, if you were to make a note, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, the promise of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the day of the Lord, the signs were fire mingled with blood. That was the signs of that happening. Okay? Uh, let's see here. Verse 10. The third angel sounded. There fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. The third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars. By the way... One of the accompanying signs of the days of the Lord is the sun being darkened, the moon being turned to blood, the stars withdraw their shining. Third part of the stars. 
third part of the stars is the exact amount that the dragon cast down to the earth with his tail. Do you know what those stars are? According to the Bible, you know what stars are? What are they? Angels. You know what angels are made of? Fire. Angels. Their substance of what they're made of is fire. It's in the Bible. And these angels are going to be cast down to the... It literally is going to rain fire on this earth. So as the third part of them was darkened, the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld, uh, Let me read this, and I'm going to teach you something, and I'm going to let you out of here. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. That is, sounds like my wife when I'm backing our car up. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. To the, how many woes? To the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of, three, of the three angels which are yet to sound. Now you see consistently here in chapter 8, it's always a third part of the creatures, a third part of the sea, a third part of the moon, third part of the sun, third part of this, third part of that. Let me run down a little something in the Bible for it. It's just interesting to me, but I think it, I think it means, I think it sheds light on this. Okay? How many sons did Noah have? Three. Do you know that two out of those three sons had blessings on them and one of them was cursed? A third of Noah's sons had a curse on them. Okay? How many crosses were there on Golgotha? Three. Do you know that two thirds of the people on those crosses went to paradise that day? One third of them didn't. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that God created you to be spirit, soul, and body? Two-thirds of that group are going to leave this world and go up, and one-third is going to fall. You see it? I got little doodads coming in the back of my neck. Okay? That kind of stuff, God's a genius. You will, listen, you'll dig and dig and dig and you will never dig all the gold nuggets out of this book. Amen. Never in your lifetime will you get, will you get done with that stuff. And I, I've got a list of those two-thirds and one-thirds. I mean, I've got a list of them. I can't remember all of them. But it's just all through the Bible. Two-thirds up, one-third down. Same with the angels in heaven. Two-thirds of the angels are blessed, stay in heaven, one-third gets cast down. And that's what you see in Revelation chapter 8. Amen. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets, the three angels which are yet to sound. Where are we going to next? Let's just stop right here. We're going to study Daniel chapter 3. Man, look at that. Three score cubits, six cubits. Sixty and six. What does that tell you? Okay. And for not worshiping the beast, for not worshiping the image, the fiery trial came. And Jesus stood with them the whole time. Fire insurance. Amen? Fire insurance. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so good. This Bible is so full of riches that Father, and it's free. Free riches. To anybody who will believe, who will study, who will think on these things, meditate on these things, ask for help and guidance from you, God, there's just free, free, wonderful, wonderful, amazing things in this book. Lord, teach us your ways. We're living in this world right now, God, because things are going on. We're starting to see things in our Bibles come to light in a way that we never saw them before. And Father, I just pray, dear God, that you would help us in our lives, focus our minds on your word, get us out of the world, give us knowledge and understanding and wisdom, Father, because I believe, Lord, and God, if I'm wrong, please, please correct me. 
God, the only thing I care about, and you know this, is telling people what this book says. That's all I care about. Father, help me. If I'm wrong, Lord, I'll come out and say I was wrong. I'm, this, this is what the Bible says. But God, if you are going to bring us through days of fire, we ask you, God, Lord, that we be like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. That not even the clothes we wear have even the scent of smoke on them. That's how much you protect your people. God, bring us through all the fiery trials. The little ones, the bigger ones. Maybe, God, you're training us for the one big fiery trial. If so, Lord, teach us, God, and help us. Bless your people, Lord. I love them. I know you love them, God. Give them a good rest of the week. Bring us back, Lord, to Sunday morning. We'll worship you and we'll sing and we'll shout. We'll preach your word. Lord, just bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. You're dismissed. You got to hug somebody, shake their hand before you leave.